Well, good afternoon and welcome uh, again to Samaritan's Purse uh, International Health Forum. I appreciate your patience as we had a slight technical difficulties there, but uh, we're back on cue now. Uh, I want to wish everyone a Merry Christmas and again, I appreciate you being here. Um, to start off with, we really want to encourage you to engage uh, in uh, a dialogue with us uh, throughout this presentation. We try to uh, really have a, a laid back um, presentation, if you will. Um, so uh, please utilize your chat box, um, which is to the right of your screen there. Um, and uh, before we get started today, I want to uh, once again uh, invite my colleague uh, Beth Thompson uh, to open us up in a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the opportunity to come and hear from Dr. Perry. Lord, speak to us today. I just pray that it will be a great learning time and uh, that you just bless our conversation and this webinar today. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, um, I am delighted uh, to have today Dr. Henry Perry, uh, who is a good friend of Samaritan's Purse. Um, just to introduce Dr. Perry, um, he is a senior scientist uh, in the Health Systems Program of the Department of International Health at Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Uh, he has special interest in community uh, health workers uh, and their capacity uh, to improve access uh, to health services and to health of the underserved around the world. Uh, Dr. Perry uh, is a graduate both of uh, Duke uh, University as well as uh, Johns Hopkins, and he has uh, a diverse training experience uh, in general surgery, public health, as well as sociology and anthropology. Uh, Dr. Perry has worked as a consultant uh, with UNICEF, USAID, uh, the Gates Foundation, as well as many others. He is also a founder of the international NGO uh, Cure Americas Global, uh, which is now working in Bolivia, Guatemala, Liberia, Sierra Leone, and uh, Kenya. And so with that, I'd like to introduce um, our topic today. Uh, Dr. Perry will be discussing why community-based primary health care and community health workers are so important. Dr. Perry, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks a lot, Lance, and greetings, everyone. Uh, it's always a great pleasure for me to connect with Samaritan's Purse, uh, as I have done for many years now. And there are many reasons for it. I've always been a great admirer of the work that Samaritan's Purse has done. But uh, also, I have a personal connection since I was born in Boone and uh, have long-standing connections with Boone, where Samaritan's Purse is located, but uh, hoping to get by there one of these days for a visit with Lance, but uh, so far <laughs> it's been elusive. But uh, in any event, uh, I'm very happy to be with you today. Uh, I'm going to share some uh, thoughts and recent experience about community health workers and their role in uh, making community-based primary health care services available to people. And we'll be focusing uh, primarily on the bigger picture uh, from a global perspective and from a policy perspective. And I have a lot of slides. Uh, I hope you'll bear with me. I'm going to try to get through this in 40 minutes or so and then have uh, time for questions uh, at the end. And I look forward to all of this. Uh, <clears throat> We have uh, known about community health workers for a long time now, and they've uh, been uh, working in various uh, shapes and forms for quite a long time now, but there's a, a rapidly emerging global consensus now that <clears throat> we really need to be uh, engaged with these workers in a more serious way than we have in the past. Uh, we now estimate that there are roughly about uh, 5 million community health workers around the world, and India has uh, by far the largest number of community health workers, some 2.3 million, but uh, virtually all countries have community health workers in some form or other, but national programs are now becoming stronger and better recognized, and you see here in this slide, the numbers of community health workers in various countries uh, based on what we know now. Uh, Indonesia's uh, community health worker program is not well known, but uh, there are 1.5 million of them. Brazil has a, a massive program of 240,000 community health workers. Uh, Ethiopia, you see here, has 128,000. That's a little bit 
of a um, misnomer perhaps. There are about 38,000 health extension workers in Ethiopia who were fully trained uh, community health workers with one year of training. But in addition to that, there are some 4 million volunteers called the Health Development Army who are working there. And uh, Bangladesh uh, is another leading program along with Nepal. Uh, <clears throat> but let's go to the next slide. Uh, I've been involved uh, quite heavily now for several years in national community health worker programs. And we were able to produce this 468-page uh, uh, volume that came out in 2014, which is focused on approaches to developing and strengthening community health worker programs at scale. Uh, this is a reference, a reference guide, and it also has um, about 100 pages of uh, examples of national health worker programs uh, in the various countries. Uh, that I mentioned previously. It's a great resource and as you can see from the link there you can download it off the website but it's designed for uh, groups who are interested in expanding community health worker programs or strengthening them or starting afresh with a new program so it's been a great national resource. Go to the next slide please. Uh, another work I've been involved with over the last uh, year or so has been uh, a project with the um, <clears throat> Partnership for Strengthening uh, Community Health Workers uh, that's part of the Special Envoys Office of the Secretary General of the United Nations. And this report was produced back in the summer. But it's, uh, it's <clears throat> it uh, summarizes here the various uh, benefits that can be achieved by large uh, national investments in community health worker programs. And one of the things that I learned from this um, is that not only are there important health benefits to be gained by uh, developing uh, community health worker programs that reach down to every household and provide uh, evidence-based interventions that we know are effective in improving health and reducing mortality, but there are a lot of social benefits that countries can um, can achieve by investing in these uh, programs, such as um, the impact on the local economy by giving uh, people a, a living wage in a very poor environment, the benefits for women's empowerment, uh, the long-term effects for development of uh, investing and improving the lives of very poor people are significant benefits when looked at from the long-term perspective of investments in economic uh, and social development, not only the health effects. And so uh, with the growing evidence that community health workers, when properly trained and supervised, can improve health in so many different ways, I'll be focusing mainly on maternal and child health here but also in terms of uh, HIV programs, TB and malaria, and we're learning more about their contributions to chronic diseases as well. So um, not only are these benefits important, but other benefits for social and economic development are important by investing in these programs and giving these workers a, a living wage as well and not simply relying on volunteers. Uh, go to the next slide, please. Uh, another activity that I have gotten involved with, and I know Samaritan's Purse, of course, uh, played such an important role in the Ebola response in West Africa, but a number of uh, colleagues of mine in West Africa, uh, as well as other colleagues at Harvard, have joined with me, and we have uh, written a paper that makes the case that strong national community health worker programs are an important component in the post-Ebola era for a variety of things. Uh, first of all is uh, the early detection of Ebola outbreaks. Uh, the early outbreaks in West Africa occurred in very isolated and very remote places and if we had had a strong community health worker program uh, working at that time and they had been aware of the signs and symptoms of Ebola and could have reported those early on, 
uh, we could have averted the catastrophe that in fact did emerge. Uh, so that's one important role that a strong community health worker program could play. Um, in addition to that, um, there, there is the potential for detection of future outbreaks that people know are going to be coming along at some point. But uh, another aspect of this which is of great interest to me and is of growing interest in West Africa is how community health workers can be involved in surveillance not only for Ebola and other outbreaks such as measles or polio but also in vital events registration and then finally uh, community health workers are an important uh, component if they're uh, well developed well trained and well supervised in strengthening health systems and building trust between the population and the health system which uh, were major issues that arose in the Ebola outbreak uh, let's move to this next slide here and you see uh, an estimate of the annual number of uh, maternal and child deaths uh, present uh, now. Uh, we don't <laughs> talk much typically about stillbirths but they're a very important part of the emerging global health agenda now as we have better evidence about the numbers of stillbirths and what can be done to prevent stillbirths. But if you, <clears throat> if you add all these up the maternal deaths, the stillbirths, deaths during the first month of life which are an increasing component of under five mortality and deaths among children uh, <clears throat> 1 to 59 months of age you come up with almost uh, 10 million uh, women and infants and children who are dying every year about 95% uh, of these are in 75 low-income countries that have been traditionally called the countdown countries uh, thinking about the countdown to 2015 when the MDG goals were supposed to have been met but uh, about two-thirds of these are estimated to be readily preventable or treatable by far the great majority uh, go ahead looking from the global perspective as well we we have roughly one and a half million deaths uh, from HIV 2.3 million new infections 35 million people living with HIV uh, a smaller number but still substantial number of uh, TB deaths and new cases and a significant number of malaria deaths and cases as well and we know that uh, all of these as well as uh, a great uh, proportion of the maternal and child deaths can be uh, greatly influenced by the development of community-based programs uh, we have this concept in global health called DALIs, Disability Adjusted Life Years, and they are used to describe the burden of disease that builds on the combination of uh, lives lost through mortality as well as uh, healthy lives affected by serious disability. And um, this has a rather complicated method for calculating it, but still it's becoming a standard now in global health and uh, linking mortality and morbidity together we've been able to compute uh, what the major causes of the burden of disease are globally and um, according to the most comprehensive report which was completed in 2010 these are now ischemic heart disease, uh, stroke, low back pain, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease and major depressive disorders. Uh, go on to the next slide but if you look at uh, the burden of disease in low-income countries as opposed to a global perspective we see quite a different picture and uh, here uh, the major burden of disease measured in DALIs are focused on very different kinds of issues from childhood undernutrition to uh, unsafe water sanitation and hygiene unsafe uh, sexual uh, relationships, uh, suboptimal breastfeeding, indoor smoke, vitamin A deficiency. And these are all issues that don't require higher level facilities or higher level uh, personnel to address and community health workers have a very important role to play in this and as I'll try to mention as we move through this uh, talk there uh, they can be and will increasingly play an important role 
and the chronic diseases such as hypertension and diabetes and, uh, and even mental health issues, I think. Go ahead. Uh, we've got an enormous challenge from a global perspective in expanding the coverage of uh, key services. Uh, the Global Health Workforce Alliance has estimated that there are a billion people in the world that have never had contact with a trained health care provider. That's pretty astounding. That's almost uh, one-seventh of the world's population. Uh, we know that the coverage of key interventions for improving maternal and child health are very low in the countdown countries uh, that I described earlier. And I'll uh, give a little bit more information about that in just a second. And then the other important fact for me is that uh, we also know from many studies that the utilization of healthcare facilities, whether it's a hospital or a primary healthcare center, is uh, greatly affected by your distance away from it. So the utilization diminishes exponentially with your distance from a health center. And in most studies I've seen, uh, once you're more than about three kilometers away from a health facility, the likelihood of your utilizing that facility really dramatically declines. The other thing that's associated with this is that there is an inequity in utilization of health facilities. That is to say, uh, people who utilize health facilities tend to be better off in terms of income and educational level. And we know that the more, more marginalized and poorer segments of society have the greatest burden of disease. And so it's very hard to achieve high levels of coverage and and equity when you're relying simply on healthcare facilities in low-income countries. Next slide. I've always liked this uh, slide. It's uh, a depiction of where uh, child deaths, under five deaths, are occurring throughout the world. This was uh, made about a decade ago, uh, but it hasn't changed substantially since. But it, each one of those dots um, represents uh, 5,000 deaths, roughly, and you see the concentration of the number of these deaths in South Asia and um, in various parts of Africa, particularly Nigeria, um, and the very few numbers of deaths in the United States and in, uh, in South America as well. Uh, this next slide uh, gives a very good depiction of the low coverage of some of the key uh, child survival indicators. Uh, generally speaking, the coverage for immunizations and vitamin A is quite high in the very poorest countries of the world. It's around 80 percent. And you see here in the next to the last column on the right for DP vaccine, it's about 80 percent. But for the other um, key interventions, the rates are less than 60 percent, and uh, these are all uh, very basic interventions that uh, everybody needs to reduce their uh, levels of mortality from uh, family planning to antenatal care to skilled attendance at birth, uh, postnatal care for the mother and the baby, exclusive breastfeeding, and antibiotic treatment of pneumonia. And so we have a long ways to go in low-income countries in expanding the coverage of these key interventions. And there's no conceivable way to do this without a stronger community health worker uh, cotter to provide these services to the people who aren't getting them now. Next slide. This is a uh, graph that depicts the results of an extensive analysis that was carried out in South Africa of utilization of health facilities uh, based on one's uh, distance away from it. And you see here that if the travel time is more than 30 minutes to reach a, a health center, the utilization of that health center has a dramatic decline and gets down to virtually uh, zero when you get more than an hour or an hour and a half away from that facility. And uh, if you take a country like Ethiopia, for instance, 90% uh, of the population lives more than 90 minutes away from a health center. And in Kenya, uh, two-thirds of the population uh, lives more than an hour away. So 
it makes it very obvious that to provide health services, you've got to have another delivery strategy to make that possible. Next slide. There's a lot of emphasis now on universal health care or universal health coverage, and I wanted to make a few comments on that and, and contrast it with the Alma Ta version of primary health care. Uh, we now uh, are entering an era into an era where we'll be hearing a lot and talking a lot about uh, universal health coverage, uh, but the language about primary health care is getting a little bit lost, and so I'm going to try to make a few contrasts uh, to these different perspectives. Uh, universal health coverage uh, has a number of different meanings to it, uh, one of the important meanings is from the insurance standpoint. So there's a lot of focus when we talk about universal health coverage as ensuring uh, adequate uh, payment for services for people who are providing them, but in a way that uh, makes it possible for the persons receiving those uh, services to receive them free of charge. And so the financial payment part of this uh, is uh, an integral part of the dialogue about uh, universal health coverage uh, for basic services. But uh, I worry that uh, this focus on the insurance and payment side is going to strengthen the focus on uh, facility-based care to the exclusion of uh, services that community health workers can provide. So the, the Alma Ta concept of primary health care involves utilization of community health workers and provision of services as close as possible to the home. And that's not really lifted up and, and, and given the proper emphasis in the literature that I've read about universal health coverage. Go ahead. So um, here are a few more thoughts about uh, the ambiguous nature of the term coverage from the insurance standpoint as opposed to the actual uh, percentage of a population that uh, utilizes or has access to essential services or to the key interventions that we know are important for reducing mortality of mothers and children. Go ahead. So um, I, I I find myself uh, making some controversial statements, uh, and so I'm going to be a little bit pr provocative here, but uh, I spend a lot of my time uh, poking around on available evidence, and uh, I haven't found any evidence yet that simply investing in health facilities alone can increase the health of a geographically defined population. Uh, but there is uh, lots of evidence that by developing community-based programs using community health workers that reach down either to the household or close to the household can in fact improve the health of populations of people, whether that's defined as coverage of key services or actual reductions in mortality. Um, and so that's uh, one of the reasons why I'm so passionate about community-based primary health care and community health workers. Go ahead. Uh, I was able to publish with uh, two colleagues, Rose Zuliger and Mike Rogers, a comprehensive review about the effectiveness of community health workers, uh, as you see here uh, on the left in the slide. And we have an interesting history of the whole community health worker movement in this uh, report as well as a review of studies of their effectiveness in high-income countries, mostly the United States, and middle-income countries. And um, based on this uh, and my own experience working in this area, I think it's safe to say that uh, uh, although in the past many people looked on community health workers as a temporary second-class uh, response to an immediate problem, uh, I think the consensus is changing uh, so that uh, we're now starting to regard 
community health workers is a permanent solution that is necessary anywhere in the world to achieve a high functioning uh, health program and to achieve optimal results in terms of uh, health status. And we have a, a very rapidly growing community health worker, Cotter, in the United States that are involved increasingly in reaching out to underserved areas to improve access uh, to needed services, focus on health education, follow up on patients who have been discharged from the hospital and so forth. So uh, I now say that community health workers are the foundation for achieving health for all. But of course this requires that they be properly trained and supervised and well supported with the logistics, whether they're drugs or other supplies and equipment. And um, increasingly we're seeing that these people will have an important role to play once maternal and child health issues are not the priority that they currently are in, as we move towards the epidemiological transition and beyond it where chronic diseases are, are the major burden of disease in low income countries and particularly in detection of hypertension. It's not hard to imagine a community health worker visiting every home, which they currently do for mother and child health now, but visiting those homes, detecting people who have hypertension and describing, prescribing treatment for them and monitoring their treatment for hypertension as they do in many places now for tuberculosis surveillance and treatment and HIV uh, surveillance and treatment as well. Um, Ethiopia is a great example of uh, what can be achieved with community health workers and I'll show a little bit more about that in just a second. Uh, I've had the privilege of uh, visiting Ethiopia twice now within the last year and I've uh, read a lot about it and you can see here in this slide on the right the rapid expansion of uh, health extension workers that occurred in Ethiopia starting about uh, 2006 or so, uh, starting off with virtually zero, small number, and expanding that substantially up to about uh, 38,000 people now. And uh, there have been many dramatic improvements in health in Ethiopia in the realm of child health, maternal health, HIV, and TB. But one of the most dramatic has been the expansion of the contraceptive prevalence rate in Ethiopia uh, through the use of uh, CHWs and their provision of injectable contraceptives. And now they're also implanting in the forearm the long-term uh, hormonal implantable con uh, contraceptive as well. And it's a great example of uh, a family planning program that's been integrated into a broader primary health care system that relies on community health workers. And so uh, I think Ethiopia is now recognized as a leader in Africa for strengthening its community health worker system and showing dramatic improvements in uh, national health at a number of different levels and indicators. Uh, in my review that I've been involved with, uh, with colleagues uh, in which we've been looking at uh, many studies now, about 800 as a matter of fact, of uh, utilization of community-based interventions to uh, improve maternal and child health, uh, we have found that there are four uh, basic strategies for implementing uh, these programs. Uh, three of them require community health workers and the fourth one doesn't necessarily require community health workers but benefits from them. Uh, one is uh, visitation of all households to provide health education, uh, detection of uh, sick people and um, even immunization and nutritional monitoring, uh, provision of micronutrients, uh, detection of pregnancies, all kinds of things can happen when you have a system in which somebody visits a home on a regular basis. There's a growing evidence about the uh, power of participatory women's groups and there are various kinds of these that are focused on maternal and child health. The, the two best known ones of these are called care groups which NGOs have uh, led the way in and developing, uh, in which a volunteer visits 10 households every two weeks to provide a health education message. 
The other one is called participatory learning and action groups, uh, which are groups of women led by a facilitator who comes to the village uh, once a month uh, to talk about uh, mostly maternal health, uh, pregnancy-related issues, and care of newborns. Uh, most of us, I'm sure, have heard of community case management. We now have integrated community case management where community health workers are trained to diagnose and treat pneumonia, malaria, and diarrhea. And in this case, uh, diarrhea is now being treated not only with oral rehydration uh, therapy, but also zinc. Uh, the fourth type of delivery mechanism is outreach services provided by mobile health teams. Uh, these are generally staffed by workers at the most peripheral uh, primary health healthcare facility, and they are groups of people of higher level staff who go out into communities to provide immunizations, uh, occasionally family planning services, and occasionally other uh, services such as vitamin A distribution. And many times, community health workers are involved in linking the community with these outreach sites uh, on the days that they come. Go ahead to the next one. Uh, in addition to these implementation strategies, uh, these projects that we have reviewed, including many NGO projects, have, uh, have important ways in which they provide support and strengthen com community-based programs, uh, training, supporting community health workers, uh, strengthening linkages between community health workers and first level facilities by providing training opportunities or getting the community health workers to the facilities for meetings and training, um, helping community health workers to better mobilize the community and create demand for services. And there are a whole variety of activities that have been developed in the programs that have utilized this approach that involve uh, mapping of the community, uh, taking a census of those to identify who exactly is in need of services, and working with the community in a collaborative way to do this. And our work at uh, Cure Americas uh, dates back more than three decades in this type of work. Go ahead. Uh, BRAC is one of the uh, great leaders in community health globally. It's uh, now the largest NGO in the world. Uh, it was previously exclusively in Bangladesh, but is now uh, spreading throughout Africa and other countries of Asia. And one of my favorite projects of BRAC's is a program they have in the urban slums in various cities in Bangladesh that uh, now covers 8 million people, but involves all of these principles of uh, having community health workers who visit every home, uh, identifying uh, everybody in the population, and then providing uh, basic uh, birth care, antenatal care, and care of uh, sick children through this very well-developed uh, community-based uh, system that builds around two levels of community health workers that BRAC has. Uh, I've been involved in other research that estimates how many lives could be saved if we were able to expand the coverage of all the basic evidence-based interventions that we know can be provided at the community level uh, outside of facilities. And uh, we have a a tool here that you may have heard of that's been developed at Hopkins called the Live, Lives Save Tool. And it's available on the website that you can look at it. But we have used this tool and we've asked the question, if we raise the coverage of all of these basic interventions up to 50%, how many lives would we save each year of mothers, um, their uh, their newborns and children under five, and including in this would be how many stillbirths could we uh, prevent as well. And if we were able to get the coverage up to just 50% of these interventions, we'd save 1.4 million lives. If we could get it up to 90%, we'd save 3 million lives a year. I wanted to share a few words about the NDGs and the SDGs Probably most of you have heard of MDGs, but probably fewer of you have heard of the SDGs. 
The MDGs, of course, are the Millennium Development Goals that were established in the year 2000 at the turn of the millennium by the United Nations uh, to be achieved by the year 2015, which, of course, uh, we're just now uh, approaching as we end this uh, current year. Uh, and those MDGs had several important uh, health goals in them, but they were all geared towards low-income countries, so they were focused on uh, reducing under-5 mortality rates by two-thirds and also reducing maternal mortality by three-fourths in uh, all low-income countries. And there was another important goal which involved the uh, control of uh, HIV, TB, and malaria. So there were, I think, maybe 11 uh, MDG goals altogether that included various aspects of development. Uh, and three of those 11 were focused on health, or four, I should say. Um, but the SDGs have now replaced the MDGs. They were established at the General Assembly of the United Nations uh, back in September. Uh, there are a variety of these, and health doesn't play as prominent a role in these as they did in the MDGs. Uh, these are to be achieved over a 15-year period as well, just as the uh, MDGs were. Uh, go ahead. So I know you can't read this, but uh, this is a list of the various uh, sustainable development goals. and they're much more globally focused and applicable to developed countries as well as uh, lesser developed countries. The goal number three is the one that's really focused on health. It says ensure healthy lives and promote well-being for all at all ages. So it's not just focused on mothers and children or on HIV, TB, or malaria. Go on to the next one. So these are the various uh, goals that relate specifically to health, and uh, you can read these uh, more at your leisure. But if you go to the next slide, you'll well, uh, this is also the uh, continuation of these specific goals. But go to the next one. Uh, these are the ones that are of particular interest for us and what I'm talking about today. Um, universal health coverage, uh, including financial risk protection, access to essential services, and essential medicines and vaccines. Uh, so uh, universal health coverage uh, is important for the new uh, sustainable development goals, but also having a better workforce, uh, a better developed, better trained workforce to be able to provide these services is now seen as uh, essential uh, because of the tremendous shortage of uh, health workers in low-income countries. And there is no way to really make serious progress on either, either of these without a strong commitment to expanding community health worker services. Next slide. Now, most of you probably know about the alma -Ta Declaration of 1978, the famous uh, Declaration of Health for All by the year 2000. Uh, this has been uh, really the, the Bible, if, if you would be willing to say that, the Bible of primary health care from my standpoint. It's a document that's only three pages long. But it's a very powerful statement about uh, the need to develop services that are uh, oriented to the community's needs and that involve communities in the, uh, in the development and implementation of basic services. And a lot of the universal health coverage uh, language doesn't really reflect the spirit of Alma Ta and the focus on primary health care through community collaboration and community participation that is um, necessary for having a fully developed uh, community health worker program that's integrated with facilities that is necessary for the achievement of uh, optimal effectiveness of what we know programs can do. But I encourage you to uh, read this entire document if you've never read it. I go back and read it. Uh, fairly frequently, and it's always, uh, for me, like reading the Bible. It's, it's always got a, 
a deep uh, wisdom to it that's always refreshing and, re and instructive. Go ahead. So I think there's a certain tension between the concept of universal health care and the concept of primary health care as defined at Almata. And I would encourage you to be aware of that and to think about it when you can. Go ahead. Uh, I wanted to make a few comments about the, the contribution of NGOs to national community health worker programs. This is an area of growing interest and engagement. Uh, there's been a long history of NGOs developing their own community-based programs and training their own community health workers to carry out the kinds of activities that they think are appropriate and having less engagement with uh, national programs. And there are many good reasons for this uh, having occurred. But uh, moving forward, I think NGOs are recognizing that uh, they need to be much more engaged in, in helping to support national community health worker programs in various ways. And uh, I would encourage you to read this document called NGO Principles of Practice for how NGOs might engage with national community health worker programs. And mention briefly uh, two examples of NGO work that uh, is in harmony with these principles. Uh, World Vision has taken a very aggressive stance in virtually all of its programs around the world to embrace and support uh, national community health worker programs in those areas where uh, World Vision has its own programs uh, functioning, but not only that, they're very actively involved in national policy dialogue and discussion and uh, advice and support to the government on how to strengthen their community health worker program. And in Ghana, just recently, World Vision provided the technical support for the uh, development of a new training protocol for their national community health worker program. So that's just one example. I've also been involved in Sierra Leone with Concern, Concern Worldwide and the child survival program they have in the slums of Freetown. And Concern Worldwide has been a very active participant in the national policy dialogue about developing a new community health worker program, which has emerged in Sierra Leone just within the last couple of years. Next slide. Uh, I'm taking a little longer than I had hoped to, but I wanted to end up with a few comments about some of the Christian connections to community health workers and community-based primary health care. Uh, in the next slide, you'll see a picture of uh, one of my heroes, Carl Taylor, who uh, was the behind-the-scenes author of the Declaration of Alma Ta at the uh, major international conference on primary health care held at Alma Ta, sponsored by UNICEF and WHO, and attended by virtually all the governments of the world in 1978. Uh, he was the founding chairman of our Department of International Health at Hopkins back in the 60s, and uh, was the son of uh, medical missionaries uh, who spent their lives uh, providing primary health care in the villages of North India. And Carl himself, at the beginning of his career, was a, a medical missionary with the Presbyterian Church in North India as well. And his spirit of engagement with local communities and responding to the needs of local people and his own awareness of the limitations of uh, health facilities themselves to really respond to the needs of people was a driving force in his leadership for primary health care and for community health workers. Next slide. Uh, back in the late 60s and early 70s, uh, when I was getting an MPH at Hopkins, I learned about the Christian Medical Commission and their role in raising the importance of primary health care and the need to strengthen primary health care services around the world. And their work uh, had a very powerful influence on the World Health Organization and was uh, a key force in, in leading up to the International Conference on Primary Health Care at Alma Time, 1978. And this has been described very well in an article that was published in the American Journal of Public Health in 2004. So you might be interested in reading that. Next slide. 
Uh, this scribble that you see here is uh, an attempt that I've made to uh, look at some very important uh, influences on the development of primary health care uh, and in particular community-based primary health care programs that have been uh, terribly influential in uh, moving this whole activity forward. Uh, and Carl Taylor is uh, one of the central figures in this. But uh, I thought I would just mention here very briefly perhaps one example of this, which is the JOMCED Comprehensive uh, Rural Health Project in JOMCED, India, that was directed by Raj and Maybella Rowley, very strong Christians who trained at Hopkins. But the, the JOMCED project was the first community health worker program in India and has had an enormous influence not only on the development of health services in India and in fact the expansion of community health worker programs in India but in many other countries around the world. I could talk much more about this uh, but uh, given the fact I'm using more time than I hoped I would I think I'll uh, stop here uh, and go on to the next slide. So I think in conclusion, uh, we're, we're entering a golden age of community-based primary health care and community health worker programming that I think is essential for us uh, as we move forward with our quest of achieving health for all. And I think there'll be a continued uh, role for NGOs to contribute to this effort and uh, increasingly to support national programs rather than running their own programs in isolation. Next slide. So I hope we can play this for you. This is a three-minute uh, video about community health workers that I've, I've seen probably uh, 200 times now. But I always enjoy watching it. I think it's a good, upbeat way to end my presentation. So we'll see if this can get going for you. Imagine a health worker. It's simple, isn't it? Isn't it? Let's imagine she's... Or she's... Imagine she's a he. Let's stick with a her. What about we call her Flo? Florence. Flo. The thing is, whatever a health worker looks like, whatever she's called, imagine this. She saves lives every single day. She's amazing. But like many of us, she dreams of more. Imagine that dream takes her to the big city. Don't have to imagine that. This is what happens time and time again. She might get a job at a private clinic. Maybe she moves abroad to chase her dream. Look, no. here she is in London. She's working in a hospital. Now imagine what's happened to us. The people she left behind. My wife died when she gave birth. No health worker to help her. Nobody in our village gets vaccinated. Our children are dying from pneumonia and diarrhea. We don't know how to protect ourselves from HIV and malaria. It would only take one health worker to show us. There are 2,000 people in our community, yet we don't have a single health worker. Where's, Where's the, the health, health worker? worker? Where, Where is she? Is she? It's hard to imagine a billion people. It's harder still to imagine a billion people without a health worker. Okay, Chira, imagine this. Imagine she stays. What would it take to make her stay? Imagine investing in her. Imagine paying her a living wage. Imagine giving her quality training that she can pass on. And imagine giving her the proper tools for the job. Now she's got support. She feels safe. She's also got the respect of the people around her. We listen to her and we learn. She is important to us and we value her. Imagine what would happen then. Over the years, she could save hundreds of lives. She could inspire and train hundreds of others to become health workers like her. I could be one of them. So could I. Each of us could be saving lives in our own communities. Imagine, imagine that. And then imagine 
what happens next? And then? And then? A health worker for everyone, everywhere. Imagine that. Now help us make it happen. Well, we got started a little bit late. I've got about seven minutes still before our hour is up. I'm happy to try to address any questions uh, that you may have. Uh, so do I read them or will somebody, I guess, Lance, will you uh, ask me the question directly on behalf of the people who are participating? Yeah, yes, uh, Henry, I will, uh, I will uh, address uh, the questions as they come. Um, let me... Uh, just uh, while we're waiting, uh, just uh, say how much we appreciate um, your presentation, um, uh, excellent presentation with regard to community health workers and, and uh, access to primary health care. Um, I think uh, there's uh, unequivocally um, as we go forward that uh, as there are, there's a limitation to access to traditional health care providers like physicians and nurses that uh, in the developing world, um, that uh, you know, access to community health workers is going to be essential. So, um, that was a, a great presentation. Thank you. Uh, yeah. So, uh, with that, um, our listening audience, um, Dr. Perry is available. Do you have uh, questions that we can address for him today? Let me quickly say I did notice on uh, one of the uh, written comments there about my paper on the community health worker programs as a response to the Ebola crisis. Uh, I can share that with people individually, but since it's under review and hopefully coming out in a journal soon, we can't make it widely available, but I'd be happy to send that to individuals if uh, they want to contact either Lance directly or one of the staff there or, or contact me. I can send you a copy of it. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, Yes, yeah, so we have a question. Um, it says, do we plan on making communities uh, to be uh, a certain degree trained so at the uh, event a health worker is temporarily uh, unavailable, uh, they can fill in? Right, so uh, that question revolves around one of the many, many operational issues that community health worker programs face. And I don't have an answer to that. Obviously, uh, how that uh, need is addressed uh, varies from country to country, and within the country it varies as well. Uh, one of the weaknesses of community health worker programs is often when there is a dropout or someone is unable to work, there is not a ready substitute available. So is programs gradually strengthen, as community health worker programs gradually strengthen, we need to have a better way of filling in those short-term gaps. Uh, but I don't have a specific answer to that. Um, there is an interesting community health worker approach that's a little bit different uh, from what we normally think of in terms of community health workers, and that's called uh, CDI, Community Directed Interventions, where it started out with treatment for onchocerciasis, but in this case, the community is given the responsibility for identifying the local worker who will provide the um, mass distribution of drugs. And so they make the determination, and whenever the people designated to do this are no longer able or interested or in, in providing the services, and the community itself is the one who chooses the person to become involved in this, so it puts a a level of responsibility for substituting and replacing workers at the community level rather than at the health system level. So uh, I think we'll see more of that as time goes by, but uh, we do need ways to fill voids uh, so that services uh, are continued on and on, and there are lots of examples where this doesn't happen I'm aware of. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, thank you. Um... Yeah, Dr. Perry, uh, another excellent question. Uh, how do you envision the role of mission hospitals uh, and the missionary physicians uh, who work there uh, in participating in this uh, training uh, for community health workers 
Also, uh, with, uh, they asked the question about empowerment of national physicians with regard to this training, um, and then also uh, making a uh, connection with the, the Ministry of Health in each country uh, with the uh, training as well. Yeah. Well, that's a great question. Um, I, I think uh, one of the approaches that could be taken would be simply to help staffs and hospitals understand and know what is actually occurring in the communities as part of the National Community Health Worker Program and giving community health workers a chance to interact with staffs in hospitals and even staffs in primary health care centers so they know each other and come to have a level of respect for each other. One of the not uncommon problems is that um, community health workers often don't receive the level of respect that they really deserve. And so how we can foster better uh, human relationships between community health workers and higher level staff within the health system so that they all see themselves as part of the same team trying to work towards the same goal is a terribly important issue. And I could see that mission hospitals could make an effort to be more engaged in working with these people, giving them opportunities to come to the hospital for training and to to see um, what really takes place in a hospital and to talk about how they could work more effectively together. Uh, the question also had to do with uh, national physicians and how uh, we can engage them as well. Uh, so there's, there's a big need for engaging higher level staff, whether it's physicians or nurses, uh, in the uh, work of community health workers for them to be exposed to each other, to be trained together, to have a better understanding of what each other does. I, I think this is a growing need. We face this problem in the United States with um, non-physician health care providers, physician assistants and nurse practitioners, and there was a lot of effort made to provide training opportunities so that nurse practitioners and physician assistants could interact with uh, with physicians in training and nurses in training so they could have a better respect for each other and a better understanding of what each member of the health team does. And I think we need those kinds of approaches in low-income countries as well. All right. Um, Dr. Perry, one last question um, and then uh, we'll uh, conclude. Um, we didn't really address the issue of uh, remuneration or, or financial reimbursement for community health uh, care workers. Uh, which is uh, obviously an important piece um, uh, that sheds light on how we deal with uh, them at the community level. Any right. closing comments with that? Yeah, that's uh, that's a controversial topic and one that I uh, have uh, thought about a lot and uh, have uh, heard a lot of other people talking about as well and have read uh, a lot about it too. Um, I, I think we're moving towards uh, a world in which we have what I call a dual cotter of community health workers. One cotter, the higher level cotter would be a more professionalized community health worker who would have six to twelve months of training, would work full time and be a formal employee of the Ministry of Health, um, and uh, be capable of uh, diagnosing and treating uh, many conditions. Uh, and and we would have uh, one of these people for roughly every 2,500 population, something like that. But we also need another level of community health worker who uh, is much more numerous, who can visit every household on a regular basis as a volunteer, who would have uh, roughly a day or two of training and would provide a, a linkage between the higher level professionalized community health worker and the household and be involved in surveillance and health education and support for the community health workers. So the best example of this on a national scale, although there are a number of uh, smaller examples of it as well, is the health program in the primary health care program in Ethiopia, which as I mentioned earlier is based on a one year uh, trained health extension worker and then the Health Development Army volunteer, there's one of those for every 10 households or so in Ethiopia. So there are 4 million 
uh, members of the Health Development Army, all of these are women, and then the professionalized community health worker, the health extension worker, also all women. There's one of them for every 2,500 people. And Ethiopia is now uh, being seen as the leader for uh, development of primary health care in Africa. So I think it's a good example. I, I don't believe that we should expect people who are working more than four or five hours a week to work as a volunteer. Everybody knows how poor these people are and it's uh, exploitative to expect them to do much more than that on a volunteer basis uh, without being uh, compensated for that work. Having said that, there's an enormous uh, energy and enthusiasm for volunteer work and uh, ways in which local people can help them help their other people in the health field and we have lots of examples of volunteer work in which these people have minimal training and work of two to four hours a week and they can do amazing things. So I don't think that uh, we should focus exclusively on uh, full-time uh, salaried community health workers, but we need to build into the voluntary uh, uh, desire of people to contribute as well, and there's a lot that they can do. Okay, Dr. Perry. Well, that was, uh, again, a, a, a phenomenal presentation, um, and uh, we really do appreciate your time. I know you're quite busy, so uh, thank you so much for shedding uh, light into this uh, subject. Um, in closing, uh, I just uh, um, want to reach out to our listening audience and say that we will, in the next several days, be sending a uh, link uh, uh, to the recording uh, so that you can watch that uh, and uh, focus on that. Um, in addition, I want to remind everyone uh, about our CME uh, availability. Um, this morning you received an email that has full instruction with regard to obtaining that uh, CME credit, so I certainly encourage you to do that. Um, also on that email you received this morning, uh, there's a link uh, where you can um, link on and um, sign up uh, for uh, participating in this webinar, so I would really love uh, and encourage you to share this uh, email with uh, your colleagues so that they uh, can uh, link in and, and join us here at uh, Samaritan's Purse International Health Forum. Um, I'd like in closing just to uh, promote uh, next month's presentation. It will be um, uh, broadcast on uh, the 13th of January at uh, 12 noon Eastern Standard Time and the topic matter will be palliative care in developing countries. Um, so, uh, and the pre uh, presenter will be uh, Anna Voke. So, I encourage you to uh, join us. Uh, so, that concludes uh, today's presentation. Thank you so much for joining us here at uh, Samaritan's Purse. God bless. <laughs>